Welcome to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I just realized I should probably start opening the show a little bit differently. Maybe I shouldn't say welcome. I should say, here we are. Here we are in the Adversity to Advantage podcast. Um, so I've got Alan Johnson uh, with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Alan. No worries. All the way from rainy Essex. Yeah, sunny South End, we say. Sunny South End. I like that better. I like that much better. Um, so we have, we've never actually met in person. I actually saw a, uh, a post that you did on Facebook, which was talking about some of your story uh, and what you're doing at the moment. And I just thought, let's reach out and see if you'd like to come on the show. So give our listeners just a little bit of context. Uh, what are you passionate about? What do you do at the moment? Okay, so I have been running my business for just over two years. Um, working in a job previous to this, which I wasn't happy in. So it was a make or break moment where we had our first son on the way, Alfie. And uh, I knew that that job wasn't what I wanted to do. So I just went all in, kick-started my personal training business at the time. And uh, that was two years ago. And it's actually gone better than what I expected at the time. Um, it was a bit of a rash decision, which has really, really worked out well. Um, so yeah, I've got a young son, Alfie, who's nearly two, oh. and we've got another little baby on the way as well, due, uh, June, June 21st is a due date, and uh, yeah. So, yeah. Sounds, sounds busy. So you, you, like me, I've been in business for myself for the last two years. Um, I've certainly been on that roller coaster. Um, tell us about that rash decision. I'm just going to go there for a minute, because I, I did a similar thing. I'd just gotten divorced. Um, I was now the sole breadwinner. I have two kids um, and I quit my job because I wow. was like, yeah, so it was like, it was rash in a way, but it made so much sense as well at the time because I was like, I'm totally going to live my version of my life now, right? Um, and yes, it sounds yes. like you were, you were unhappy in your career. I mean, what made you at the time when you've got a baby coming just like take the lead? Yeah. Well, um, I'll cut like a, a long story real uh, short really but I was working in recruitment which I love the industry okay. but there was a few changes to the company I was with before and that's why I decided to move on to a new company which was local to home and it was an all-female office so no, you know nothing against females at all um, but I kind of didn't just fit in there and the job was sold to me differently to what it actually was and um, yeah, it, it just wasn't a good environment to be in. And I knew that with a baby on the way, still living at home with my nan at the time and separated from, from my fiance, we wasn't living together. I knew that the initial, you know, leaving my job, it would postpone us being able to get on the property ladder and get our own place together. But I knew that it was what I really wanted to do. Um, I prefer to be in control. So I'm probably a little bit of a control freak. I don't like to be out of control. Um, and that's why I felt that entrepreneurship was really for me. And my fiance really supported me. That she helps. actually encouraged me just to leave the job. So um, I, was, I was earning a decent inc income with that job as well. So to go from a decent income to literally zero was a pretty scary time. Um, but yeah, literally the, the, the day after I left that job, I just got started with my business, um, sharing my own story on social media, my training, what I was eating, and just to start trying to attract some clients in. Um, so yeah, it, it was a worrying time, but it was definitely looking back the best decision, I, one of the best decisions I've made. For sure. Cool, cool. Um, and we'll circle back to um, some of the ups and downs of that. Um, you're, you're definitely uh, fulfilled, it seems like, right? Um, yes. But then there can still be that that back end of you've got to learn so much, right? When you're when you're constantly uh, building a business, but equally you're doing it for you, so it feels really yes. exciting from that perspective. So let's go back. I'd love to just get a bit of context around your story. So go way, way back for a second. What was it like? growing up for you like what was the context of, of of talking as a man i guess about emotions or did you feel like you you built your resilience right when you were younger okay so the environment i was kind of brought into my mom and dad should never have been together 
they shouldn't have been a couple. Um, a lot of my childhood memories is just of them arguing, fighting, shouting, screaming, whatever else. So they just, I guess, stayed together because they felt that that was the best thing to do. I think both of them had fears of, of leaving each other um, and being alone. So, yeah, it was a bit of a negative environment. Uh, this went on for years and years. Um, and then this started negatively impacting, like, my school days, not really being able to concentrate, not being able to focus. Um, and at the time, I was getting these feelings of fear, anxiety, and worry, which I didn't understand at the time because I was only, you know, young then. So, yeah, primary school, yeah? Primary school, yeah, and into secondary school as well. Yeah. So... I didn't understand those feelings. I didn't have access to like the internet then. So, you know, it wasn't spread around so much with social media. Um, what, what, were, what were teachers' response to you not concentrating and maybe the, be showing behavior issues? I don't know what was going on at school. What was, were teachers, did they understand? Well, I, f I didn't really talk to them about it. Mm. Um, didn't feel comfortable to do that. All that would happen is I would just put, be put into a naughty class. So okay. quite a few times I was taken out of the normal class, put into um, a special group. Yeah. Which, you know, was just... Uh, right? Yeah. We didn't learn anything. We just had loads of banter, shouted at each other and played around, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't really have many people to speak to. My friends, I didn't really want to speak to about it. Um, I think a few of them kind of knew what was going on. Because, like, if they'd ever come round just for a little while, play PlayStation, Xbox, whatever, they would probably experience it at the same time, some, some screaming and, and rows and stuff. Do you, do you have any siblings? Yes, a brother, yes. I've got a brother who is 33, and I've got a half-sister as well, and we're, we're not really in contact at all. Ooh, that's a, there's a story there. Um, <laughs> when, when you yeah. were younger though, were they in the same household? Like were, were, were they experiencing the same thing? Did you have a, like a connection because of that? Yeah. So my brother was on in the same household. Um, like I say, he's three and a half years older than me and my half sister never lived with us. So she was on my dad's side of the family. So you, so you don't really have anyone to talk to. You're just thinking, did you think it was normal or did you think like every other family must be better than this? Yeah, it was. It's really strange because um, I, every day I felt so foggy in my mind. Like I couldn't even think clearly. I was having these feelings of fear and worry and anxiety, but I didn't understand them at the time. I, I kind of felt that I was questioning whether it was normal to feel like that on a daily basis. I didn't. I just didn't understand. It was. A, it was a weird kind of time, and I. I found that. A lot of the time as well, I used to just have like watery eyes. I couldn't stop them from watering. And I think it was just probably like lacking of sleep. Maybe it was like a huge strain on my eyes all the time. And I probably just because my brain was just doing so much overloaded work, that was just one of the side effects. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a crazy, uh, crazy time. Sounds, it sounds really intense. And especially when, like you say, you can't Google what is symptoms of anxiety or I feel my eyes are watering. What could that be? <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and, but I think there's good and bad maybe to that now, which is like, yeah. right. Like people go self-diagnosing and go, I have, I have this rash. I'm dying. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You just think I have bipolar disorder. Mm, you're a bit anxious and it's, it's understandable because of the environment that you're in, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're so quickly to put labels on people nowadays, aren't they? Yeah, it can, it can go both ways. But, in, I mean, how did that make you feel during this time? You know, when you were, when you were younger, what were your, some of your feelings? A lot of the time, I kind of just wanted to be by myself. Yeah. Um, lock myself away. And if I'm honest, I still love spending time by myself. Okay. Um, so I'm a little bit of an introverted person. Um, so yeah, and that's kind of what I wanted to do at the time. Um, just not really be around people, um, spend, spend time by myself, playing Xbox, PlayStation, whatever, just in my bedroom at home. Um, yeah, I wasn't very 
sociable. It wasn't, you know, didn't like socialising much. And just a bit of a quiet kid at school, really, especially in primary school. Very, very shy. Yeah, yeah. and I guess there's the, there's two sides. There's like the introvert, which some people just enjoy it and need a little bit more space. But also if something slightly traumatic is going on around you and you don't understand it, we can also isolate ourselves, right? Yeah. We don't want people to, to ask questions or to see through us or to, you know, it can be yes, totally. a of, of both, like healthy and unhealthy maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so where did that lead? How did that develop throughout secondary um, moving forward? Um, so during secondary school, like I say, I was separated from a lot of the classes some of the time to be in a separate group. Um, started smoking cigarettes, doing a few drugs yeah. here and there at the weekends with friends, Messing bunking up. off. Yeah. What's that? Messing about. Messing around, yes. Um, not wanting to be at school, so I was bunking off more often. And it got to a point where one, one morning I was woken up by my mum. So I was 14, nearly 15 at the time. And she basically had her bags packed. And she said that she was going to be leaving my dad that day. So I didn't know this was coming. So there was uh, no, this hadn't happened before. Like, Yeah, no. No, it never happened before because what she used to do a lot of the time as well was my dad was a milk, milkman. Um, he's been an alcoholic for like 30 years. Oh. So he'd always been an alcoholic. Yeah. And she used to be scared of being at home in the end. Mm -hmm. So probably like the last two or three years of them being together, um, she'd always be at the house whenever he was in. So his kind of hours from, was from like one, two in the morning, he'd leave the house and he'd get home about two, three o'clock. So from like three till eight o'clock, she'd just try and be out of the house, walking the streets. So then and who then, was like, who was cooking you dinner or who was, I imagine there were no like family meals or anything like no, that, that. not at all. Yeah. Not no. at all. And it was all very basic cooking, you know, yeah. like uh, turkey dinosaurs, potato <laughs> waffles, and beans, something like that, you know. There wasn't fruits, there wasn't vegetables, oh, nothing like that. So I, I was um, a very, very fussy eater for years uh, until I went to my nan's, which I'll, I'll go on to in a bit. So I was very fussy eater, no family meals, nothing like that. And so um, you're essentially hiding away in your room mm. or you're out with your mates messing about. And it yes. doesn't sound like anyone's chasing you in a way like checking in with school or i don't know did did you feel like that yeah, not not at all i mean the schools were a lot more lenient back then sure a lot more yeah, lenient yeah. so i know they're a lot stricter now um i think people get fines if their children are off so many days and it wasn't like that back then it's disappeared a little bit and yeah yeah the amount of times i used to go in for the the first half of the day and then go back after lunch clock in and then just go go away for the rest of the day and they wouldn't even know I was gone the next day or whatever. Right, right, right. I mean, was, was some of that time pretty exciting and fun or I'm also feeling that it must have been lonely and tough? Yeah, yeah. So when I was with my friends and was having fun and it temporarily took my focus away from what was going on at home. Yeah. And also a lot of the time as well was my friends had nice clothes, new phones, being able to go to the cinema when they wanted, you know, having sleepovers, what, what kids are doing. Sure. My, you know, it wasn't like that for me. My mum's never worked due to illnesses and my dad was a milkman, so he wasn't raking in the cash. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, yeah, so you're yeah. pretty, you know, on the bread line there and not lots, nothing extra to sort of have a bit of pocket money or, or go yeah. do your own thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's going to be tricky in just comparing yourself or feeling like you fit in or secrecy. I don't know. Or, or did it lead you to, to petty crime just to like make your own way? Yeah. So drug taken. I was arrested for drugs once just for literally a joint, um, which was really scary at the time. I felt sure. I was like 15 then. Yeah. My dad and my great auntie, his sister, turn up at the um, police station. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, give me a bit of a hiding at the time. Um, yeah, just, just 
getting up to no good. Um, we used to steal pedal bikes. I, sh- I probably shouldn't be repeating this. I might get in trouble for it. Um, <laughs> Not anymore. I'm sure there's like it's too far away now. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, so yeah, we used to do a lot of all nighters at the weekends. Yeah. And um, just we'd have a, like a garage that we'd just sleep in, drinks, partying, just having a bit of fun, really. Yeah. Sure. Um, but I, it's for, it's funny, like not to go into any of the thieving or anything. But in a way, you're learning your entrepreneurial skills because you're yeah, like, was, yeah. yeah, like resort. Like, how am I going to eat? How am I going to survive? How is everyone going to be yeah. okay? Right? You've got totally, to. Yeah. It's like we don't know what what we're learning or what part it's going to play. It's very weird because I've had so many yeah. moments in life that I'm like, this is fucked up, right? And yeah. then I look back and I go, oh my God, I learned the skill of this, right? And it's of course. paying off now. It's it's strange. So get back to that that moment where you, your mom wakes you up and says she's leaving and you haven't seen much of her a, a lot or at least your parents together for, for yes. a while. So this comes as a shock. What happens next? Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, woke me up that morning, had all her bags there, so I didn't really know what was going on. Um, and she basically said she was leaving that day and asked if I was going with her or not. So straight away, kind of just thinking in my head, you know, what am I going to do here? So I got dressed, whatever else. I walked her to the bus stop and uh, I just decided not to go. And I- I'm glad to this day I made that decision because I wouldn't be where I am now because I would have went down a completely different path so I'm glad I didn't um I don't know why I chose to stay at my dad's really I I was always a bit of a daddy's boy really okay um but I I guess it was just even though it was a negative environment I think it was my comfortable environment I was used to living there so it was probably the fear you had a sense of belonging maybe at least a little bit with your your friendships and the things you get up to totally exactly yes um so yeah i decided not to we obviously stayed in contact we used to meet at weekends in the town like i was living in romford at the time so we used to meet in romford every single week so we kept that relationship there it wasn't as if she just left me and i never spoke to her again what about your Um, brother so at this time, he would have been at college. He's a bit older, yeah. Yes, a little bit older. So this was close to when he was going to university. So he went to Colchester University um, when he was around 18. Um, so, But I know it, he's suffered with anxiety throughout the years as well. And we've had a lot of discussions about it and uh, how it's affected him. But yeah, it was it was a little bit older, so I guess he was able to maybe manage it a little bit better at the time. So how did things change since from that point on? I know you still saw your mom. She would obviously have been adjusting and settling in and figuring out her own stuff. What was your relationship like with your dad at the time? So we, like I say, when every time he would finish work so when I was a little bit younger I used to go work with him at weekends sometimes and I used to love it so on the way home we used to stop off at the local off license and he'd go in every single time bottle of Bacardi bottle of Coke and a newspaper and we'd sit there so at this age I was probably around 11 or 12 so you'd think I wouldn't know what he was doing but every single time he'd open the door slightly, like get, obviously get back in the car, open the door slightly, pour some of the Coke out, put some of the Bacardi in, and we'd just sit there for maybe an hour. He'd have a few drinks before going home. This would be on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, so over the years, that would have become a habit for him. Mm-hmm. He would have done that exact same routine. So a lot of the time when I'd see my dad, he was just drunk. Yeah, you know, not not falling over kind of drunk. Um, oh, sometimes, yeah. yeah, there was occasions like that, of course. Um, but yeah, he he would just be drunk, so we didn't spend a lot of time together from the moment my mum left to the moment I left um, when I when I was sixteen. I mean, did you feel sad at your mum leaving? Like, do you remember? like grieving in some way could you release any emotion around that or did it come out in the more masculine acceptable way of aggression and those sorts of things 
yeah, if I'm honest, at that time, I, I don't remember exactly how I dealt with it. Because a lot of my, my um, childhood is a bit of a blur. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't really remember. I, obviously, I just did the best I could sure. with the resources I had at the time. So, yeah, I, I can't really remember how I felt, but I know that I would have been a, a, a upset about it. You know, any parent separating isn't a very um, nice yeah, thing to experience. And it's not just separating. It was the, maybe the way it was handled was quite yeah. um, abrupt and you weren't met necessarily involved in the conversation other than, are you staying? Are you coming? <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's quite uh, abrupt, right? But then you've got the the after effects. And so you now are still in the kind of sidelines of school. You're just, you're messing around with your mates. Like, where does this lead to um, as far as becoming a young adult? Yeah. So the day I was 16 years old, obviously I was still meant to be at school, but yeah. I went and got a job. Nice. I was, I was working on a building site. It was through a friend. So I was working with his stepdad up in uh, London, uh, Roman Road in London, and just on the building site there. So I started earning my own money. Nice. And I, yeah, so I was able to start buying my own food as well. I was literally living on like fish and chips nearly every day uh, and chocolate. So I was able I to. You're a PT now. I'm interested in that. Around. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still try and get my head around, and my yeah. fiance does as well. Like, my past compared to how I am now is it's really it's a crazy. radical difference. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, but it probably felt pretty good to be earning a bit of money and to be feeling a bit more, you know, responsible or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I was you, able you to look like, after myself better yeah. and not have to rely so much on my dad. Yeah. 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 Which is nice. Um, and with, with that company, really enjoyed it. Um, but the directors were basically not paying the companies like Travis Perkins or Wix's being q they were building up their debt, buying, getting all the materials, yeah. using it with their company and not paying them back. Oh my, yeah. So eventually they went into like liquidization. Yeah. Um, and I lost my job basically. So I was 16 at the time. Yeah. I didn't um, actually take my GCSEs as well. So before I lost my job, um, there was like a two week period of the GCSEs, but I just decided not to take them. A short while after that, I was kind of regretted it when I lost the job, but now I realize it, it really doesn't matter. It's not so taking your GCSEs isn't going to determine whether you're going to create a success in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was your, so, was your brother any kind of role model when you were younger? I mean, you said he went off to university and stuff. Did he have, did he sort of step in as, because sometimes that happens, right? If parents are a bit absent for, with, through addiction or whatever, yeah. that the older sibling has to step in in that sort of slight parenting role. Did that kind of happen with you guys? Yeah, so it was my brother that actually got me into smoking, you know. No, <laughs> so I always blamed him for that. Um, <laughs> But Quite yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But generally, he, yeah, he was there for me. Yeah, he was supporting me. Um, yeah, he, he was there. We had a little bit of trouble once. I was over at the pub. Someone had started on me. So, as the big brother, he um, went and sorted out for me. So, yeah, any, any kind of troubled situations, he was there for me. Yeah. He was there. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so, so where did this lead? So you don't, don't do your GCSEs. I mean, would you say, I know you're talking about anxiety. I mean, are there any points in your life that you would describe as kind of rock bottom moments, which are just like, I don't literally don't know how I'm going to move forward. Yeah. So that come at around the age of 17. Okay. So when, when I'd lost my job at, at 16, I was still living in Montford at my dad's at the time. And this is when I was jobless, not earning any money anymore. So I was still in contact with my mum, still quite close to my nan as well, which is, uh, she lives in South End. So I went there for a weekend and it's been the longest weekend of my life because I, I never went home. Oh God. Okay. So you just stayed. I just stayed. Yeah. Yeah. I stayed at my nan's. Um, she's always an amazing cook. No, so, you've know, got some good food influence from exactly yes yeah, exactly and um so yeah i went there for the weekend and 
I loved it. I already had some friendships in Southend as well because um, going up there regularly, like weekends uh, with my mum as well. Over time, I, I built friendships in Southend as well. So, yeah, it was a, a nice environment to be in. So, I, I, yeah, they, they took me in as their own and I, I stayed there um, until Did literally... Are you saying that you were just pretty desperate or that something happened just before that led you to make that a weekend, but then the longest weekend of your life? I was just desperate. You just desperate. I was desperate. Yeah, I knew that I couldn't stay in that environment anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just getting uh, super unhealthy. And it sounds yeah. like you almost knew that you just weren't, weren't going to make it moving forward. Yes, exactly. You stuck there. Yes. Out. Yeah. Um, and so you, you stay with your nan and you, you've been with her up until recently, until a couple of years ago, right? When you had uh, yep. your, your baby, which is amazing. Do you feel like that gave you what you were missing or like uh, nurtured you in a way to, to, on the path that you're on now? Yeah, she's done a hell of a lot for me. Um, but when you said just now about rock bottoms, it was actually when I was around 17 years old, yeah. Um, I took a few too many tablets and pills. Yeah. And, you know, kind of trying to make myself unwell. I wouldn't say as far as take my own life. I think in, in my mind, it was probably a little bit of an attention thing. I had suicidal thoughts at the time, but I wasn't in the position where I, I wanted to just end it all. So was this, what, were you still at your dad's? No, this was when I was at my nan's. So you're now, yeah, trying to yes. figure things out. Yeah. I think it all kind of just caught up with me. Yeah. What had been going on. Yeah. Now I was becoming an adult and having to figure everything out for myself. You know, I wasn't, I was, wasn't working at the time. So I was trying to find a job, which I did sooner. Um, and yeah, I just hit that rock bottom and wanted to probably get a, a bit of attention. Yeah, and I think, but it's, I think it's a really important point that sometimes when we need to be resourceful and survive, or we're in a more of an unsafe environment, shall we say, that we just hold it all in. We have to, to keep yeah. going. Like we can't, you can't afford to fall apart. You need to eat, you need to do whatever you need to do, right? Yeah. And then as soon as we get into a safer environment, um, you know, where we can actually breathe for a second, like you say, sometimes people are surprised because they're like, well, everything, things are better now. Technically, I've got a bit of, you know, a safety net and I can move from here. But then all the emotional buildup of like a yeah. lifetime of like the arguing and the, you know, the, the tension and it would leave you quite, I, I don't know if I should go as far as saying post-traumatic stress, but in mm. a way the anxiety can be a reaction to some of those surroundings, right? And yes, then it all yes. comes crumbling down when we're, we're, we're safest. And so probably more self-harming or something. You just were like, let me numb out. Let me, you know, fuck this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and took some pills. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a build up of trauma in our bodies over time yeah. from yeah. past experiences. And yeah, the anxiety and the, the depressive feelings was becoming overwhelming, Completely. overwhelming. Completely and it was like, I was just in a real dark hole. Yeah. Um, didn't really want to eat much. Didn't want to go out, just wanted to be in my room. Yeah, it was really, really tough. And at the same time as well, my, my nan's actually suffered with depression for over 30 years. And I guess seeing her in that kind of state as well was probably impacting me too. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was a tough time and... It went on for many years, but it was very like ups and downs. So that was just a, a real lowest point where I felt like I just couldn't handle it anymore. It was done, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Were, so, were, were you opening up to anyone, whether it was mates or someone? Like to just be, were you able to say how you were feeling to anyone? So yeah, I, I had a girlfriend at the time. Okay. So um, we were together for around five or six years. So she kind of knew what I was going through and supported me. That's great, yeah. She was the only real person I'd speak to, and my, and my brother as well. 
So we say we're still close today, me and my brother. So, yeah, um, mostly my brother, my nan, and yeah. my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. And so from that rock bottom point, you start. I mean, you said that it went on for quite a number of years of just trying to figure stuff out, right? Trying to yes. find work and things like that. Um, but but now you've you've become, shall I say, somebody who thinks about personal development, you, you run your own business, it sounds like you think about mindset, you think about your healthy body and yeah. um, nutrition, it sounds like you, you've got that well-rounded, like, what do we need to, to have good well-being and, and good mental health, right? Yeah, definitely. It was, um... what's, the, what's the gap of, from like this like, craziness into the guy that you're, you're at now? Like, what were the building blocks in between? How did you move into this direction? It was personal development. Okay. So watching people like Les Brown. Yeah, yeah. Anthony Robbins. Yeah. What made you watch those kind of people, though? Were you just like, oh, I was nicking a bike two years ago, but now let's um, look on YouTube and see what will inspire me? It was actually a network marketing opportunity. Okay. I'd got involved with. Um... And that was like going to the events, being around those positive, uplifting people, being in a different environment. Yeah. That's what triggered and opened my eyes to personal development. Because before that, I didn't really know about all of these YouTubers. No, no. no. Uh, giving all these motivational talks, you know, because I wasn't, I'd never known or seen it before. No. That's all new that to world. me. And I really... I'm I'm kind of like that. I wouldn't say addictive person personality, but if I'm in with something, I'm all in. I'm all in. So I was studying a lot, listening to a lot of videos, and that's what you're filling your mind with the 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 opposite or with you know all the good stuff of what's possible. Yes, we focus our attention, our mind, all that sort of thing. Exactly, yes, yes. So I was just over-absorbing my mind with all of the positivity, all of the quotes. I was sharing them on Facebook and Instagram, and it was making me feel better. Oh, well, that's all the evidence we need, right? When we're in it, it's like, well, this is helping me feel better. Um, And so how did that, what were maybe the first changes that you noticed in yourself? So in general, you're feeling better, did you have more motivation? At what point did you start thinking, oh, maybe I should eat well too, or think about my body as a, you know, a vehicle? <laughs> so um, I would say, yeah, see, I'm not sure exact time. I mean, I would say like I was working in a job, how long ago now? This was around three and a half, four years ago. So I was in another labouring job, working with very negative people. Again, not not a great environment to be in. Um, and I, I hated the job, but I just stayed. It was just money coming in. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, basically, it would come up to Christmas. There wasn't, the boss said there wasn't much work coming in. Um, which was a little bit of a shock for me because I was like, oh, I've always been earning my own money. So I was like, what am I going to do? And that's when I was introduced to recruitment. Okay. So, um, I, yeah, I started applying for jobs and then I fell into recruitment, which I really, really loved. And being in recruitment, it felt like it was my own business. Okay. So as well as doing the personal development stuff in my own time and, and helping me grow and develop as a, as a person – then instead of doing a labouring job, I started in recruitment and all of a sudden it felt like I was working for myself. Yeah. My, my desk was like my own little baby that I was m- nurturing and building up, you know. So that's, I think that was a real turning point with the changes within my life. Starting to think better, behave better and just ultimately improve my lifestyle. Yeah, so that was around three and a half, four years ago. Yeah, yeah, and it's those small little steps, right? It's filling our mind with thing with with positive thoughts or things about what's possible, and then it's the small actions every single day, right, that build up to a completely exactly. different lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, I read the um, I read the Slight Edge. If you've ever read that before, I read that one. Okay, it's really good, but it's around 
basically tiny, small actions on a daily basis over a cons- consistent time will make massive changes in your life. Yeah, yeah, and that's what people, they want change really quickly. It's a really fast culture, right? I want to do this for a week and then feel great and be great, you know, and it be consistent when actually it's relentless action, isn't it? Even in the, yes. the smallest little things. So, so recruitment also gave you um, practice in a way, experience of kind of the hustle and you say it felt like working for yourself even though it wasn't fully. Um, and, it, and, and then at what point did PT become interesting for you? So I was training myself during recruitment. Sure. And um, like you said, I was learning a lot of skills from recruitment. So I was, I was in the construction industry, so I had to go out to site visits and just walk in cold onto, uh, onto new sites yeah, yeah, yeah. and pitch my business, which was really yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. And still at that time, I still had a lot of anxiety, but I was just pushing through that, pushing my boundaries. And I, you know, sooner, sooner or later, I become more confident doing it. I was getting better speaking on the phone, following up. So yeah, I was, I was kind of crafting those skills. And that first recruitment company I was working for, which I really, really loved, there was a few changes with the business, which I didn't like. So I went um, to a different company, more local to home. And that's what I shared earlier when it was not a great place to be working. It wasn't for me, sold a different job. And that's literally when I decided that I didn't want to work there no more. It was making me feel unhappy. So that's when I was just going to start my own personal training business and help other people with their health and fitness. And so I love just, the, again, the theme of adversity. You needed to be in the job that you kind of hated in order to push you into the job that was going to be even better for you, right? Yeah, sometimes, totally. you, sometimes when people come to me and they're like, oh, it's so hard here. It's, this is so difficult. I actually got a little bit excited. I'm like, ooh, I'm like, it's got to get bad enough for you to do the work to get you to where you want to go, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah? Um, so sometimes there's good, there's good in, in all of that stuff. Now, what do you do... Or how important, what have you learned as far as looking after yourself? Now, I know PT it comes from the physical health perspective, but you've talked about a shitload of things. Anxiety, um, trauma, how it's stored in our body. Like, What have you learned about that stuff? And what do you personally or have you done to help, um, I want to say heal you, but you know what I mean. Move through it, I guess, so you can be a healthier version of yourself. Okay, so... Um, a few actions I would say personally is plugging myself or yourself into personal development. Yeah. You know, reading, yeah. Reading books, listening to podcasts like your one, um, listening to audio. Can I just say, this is so cool for the kid who didn't take his GCSEs, right? Who's just like, read, like learning, just gather it all, be curious. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, because yeah. uh, yeah, very different, very different yeah. now. It's it's uh it's mad. So yeah, reading the books, listening to the audios. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got Audible nowadays, so that's cost yeah. you next to nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, podcasts, and with the nutrition side of things, I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. And I know there's so much convenience foods around nowadays. So it's planning is everything. So if you know what you're going to be eating, breakfast, lunch, dinner every single day, if you've got a plan plan to stick to, it will really, really help. What I find with a lot of clients is when they are in the moment of lunchtime and they're hungry and they've got nothing prepared, it's so easy for them to go to the local chip shop or McDonald's or Absolutely. Greg's grab something really quick that's what their body is kind of craving and they give in, they eat it and then feel guilty straight after. So planning is so, so important. Keeping your diet real simple, lean meats, fish, vegetables, salads, those type of foods benefit you well with the fitness side of things. So I choose to train literally five or six days a week. Um, even on like the Sunday, that's a rest day. I'll still go out for like a walk with a family, like to stay active. 
So even like 20 to 30 minutes of activity a day is more than enough. Just having that consistency rather than training seven days a week, one, one week, and then go back down to one the next week, you know, where it's up and down. Just finding the happy medium of what you can be consistent with. Yeah, sustain it, yeah. Um, yeah, getting plenty of sleep as well is something that I've sacrificed in the past, especially the first part of having my business yeah. was working relentlessly, sleeping five hours a night, you know, staying up to like 11, 11, half 11 at night, getting back up at half or five the next day. It's not, not healthy. And then so, you've got, mate, you had a new baby at the time and uh, yes. you, you're, you're raising a family and that's going to cause additional happiness, but also stresses. I have two teenagers, so I've been through it all. Yes. Yes. So you know about the sleepless nights. Yes, and the night sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah so we have to make sure that we're getting enough sleep. Um, otherwise we'll just fall unwell, not be productive. We feel like we're being more productive because we're working more hours but ultimately we're not be able, able to be as effective as what we can be if we're well rested. Absolutely. And what about the anxiety? Like, uh, did you still suffer from, from anxiety? Uh, or have you had some things that work for you to help manage it? Um, I would say it's working through the anxiety. So a lot of people that I speak to who experience anxiety will now, um, not put themselves in the situations where they get the anxiety. Avoid it, yeah. Av yeah, avoidance. Whereas if they do that, it's just going to get worse because eventually they might have to go back into those situations. So you're better off just building yourself up. So an example might be, be it, you know, you might get anxious for being in busy places. So just start off by meeting a couple of friends at a time then maybe going to a smaller event and just building yourself up over time. And even, even though you're feeling that anxiety, just deep breathing and, and getting through that experience because it will pass, pass, you know. There's never been any stories of anyone dying from anxiety. You know, it's not something you're going to die from. It might feel that way. Yeah, you've got butterflies, you're sweating, you feel yeah. uncomfortable, but you've just got to ride it out, focus on your breathing, I really like the Wim Hof breathing. If you've Tense. yeah, yeah. heard yeah. of him before. So he says about when you focus on the out breath, it will basically help to calm you down. So when you're feeling... Sorry, go ahead. So when you're feeling... I was just going to say, when you're feeling anxiety, your heart increases. So then your breathing increases. And it's just focusing on that breathing, slowing your breathing down, and you'll naturally start to calm, calm yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So you're breathing, you almost start hyperventilating, right? Like yes. You're breathing too much in. And so that Wim Hof is about, like, as you say, the out breath, uh, just to balance out. Um, and lots of trauma therapy talks about that out breath, getting you out of fight or flight. But I love that you're yeah. saying what things that I say, which is show up anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff, totally. Show up anyway, keep moving forward, even if you're feeling those things, rather than what some people do is start to isolate because they're like, oh, it's going to make me feel this. And then when you're stuck in your head, right, just you, it actually becomes worse, right? It's, yes. It becomes more overwhelming. Yeah, so, completely. Yeah, completely, so I think yeah. what you're saying is you've learned to manage it effectively, keep showing up, and uh, start your own business. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Now, do you, um, we're, almost, we're almost there, by the way. Um, well, do you think... First of all, what's what do you have a relationship with your parents now? Your your dad and your mum? So my dad uh, sadly passed away last year. Okay. Uh back in April. Um Sorry. Yeah, it was it was really tough. It was really tough. I mean, a couple of years prior to that, he had had a heart attack. Mm. So he had had a pacemaker put in. Um but then he wasn't taking his medication and he was still drinking. Yeah, yeah. He said that he'd cut down the drink. I wasn't so convinced. Yeah. Um, Cause it's not, I know that it's not that easy with addiction, nope. you know, and the amount of times that we said we'd help him and take him to A and A. Uh, a, &A yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he just, he, he didn't really want to change. He didn't, didn't want to change. So yeah, he um, kept drinking, not taking his meds. So a couple of years later, 
last year he had a heart attack and a stroke both together so he passed away and my mum lives still in the Romford area so we normally see each other like every three weeks she comes and stays at my nan's house and the relationship isn't that strong if I'm honest um, I think probably from a lot went on in the past um, I'm like my own person now and she's not a very positive uplifting person I'll, I'll just say that so I, I've learned over time that you have to be extremely careful who you spend your time with no matter who they are whether it's family or not so yeah the, the time spent together is limited so it sounds like you put some boundaries in place so you're still connected but yes. you actually guard your own mental health yes right, so that you can be the father the the boyfriend the the business owner that you need to be exactly yes spot on yes yeah. um and it, it can be quite complex when a parent passes away just a nod to your dad when there's such a complex relationship people assume that it will be a relief or that oh you know he had it coming or you know people can say all sorts of things but it actually brings up all that complexity, doesn't it? When, when, you're, yeah. when you're saying goodbye in that sort of final way, that complexity of like what was said, what wasn't said, I don't know. Did, did it bring just that stuff up for you, just reviewing it? Yeah, well, like literally um, a couple of months before he passed away, he'd had a drink again at, at home in his flat in Romford and he'd fallen over on his balcony where he had actually been found dead a couple of months later, but he'd fallen over on the balcony, hit his head, split his head open. And luckily he was meant to be working that evening and he was working just for an Indian takeaway, just, just doing the takeaways deliveries and they hadn't heard from him. So they actually went and to his flat to see if he was okay. And they could see him lying on the balcony. So they'd kick the door down and luckily took him to, got him to hospital, I, you know, ambulance come out and it survived that case. Um, so after that had happened, I went down to his flat and just been like, what's going to change? What's going to change? You know, like it, where he was living, he wasn't keeping clean. You know, the flat was dirty. So my, my fiance and son Alfie come with me, but they went to, the shops, so I, I said to my fiance, I didn't want my son in that environment. And just sitting there with him, like, what's going to change, Dad? You know, you can't keep living like this. Like, and I was trying to help him by saying, look, have you got any goals? What would you want to do? Like, do you know what I mean? What, what have you wanted to do for your life? Because he had not really done anything with his life. You know, all he used to do was just work and drink. You know, he didn't really go out socialising, didn't really do anything. So it was like, this is the make or break moment. What what do you want to change in your life? And he, he didn't know. He didn't know. Um, and I said to him even about reading, why not start reading a, a book? And he, he declined that as well. He said, oh, I, I don't like reading. The habit oh. is too ingrained, right? At, at I know. That long, but, but it sounds like you had that moment to try and do what yeah. you could. Um, to help and, and you almost think crack your head open like all the things you described if that's not going to wake somebody up then i i don't know what what will i oh, know i oh, know i know um so yeah I, I offered to pay for a gym membership for him as well but he didn't want to accept that either it, go ahead sorry i was gonna say in all fairness to him he was going through some nhs system and he was training once a week at a gym um I said to him it wasn't enough if he wanted to change his life. Once a week isn't enough. So um, I offered to pay for his gym membership, but again, he, he didn't want to accept it. But that was probably just because he probably didn't feel like he wanted to take money from me. Yeah, it's you know? re receiving help, right? And um, there, there's a lot, especially for men, about not wanting to uh, receive help in some way. Um, yeah. It also highlights the fact that we can't change other people. We right? can't even in your business or in my business, like we can't change other people. We can say things that may inspire them. We can give them the tools. But at the end of the day, a person has to do those small steps of work that you described to yeah. get you to completely radically change your life. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, do you think you needed the challenges in your life to make you into who you are today? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because yeah. now I'm so passionate yeah. about taking people out of pain yeah. into a more pleasurable experience. Because you've been there. You get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Oh, my God. I feel like we could talk for ages because I'm still curious about how trauma shows up and all the rest of it. But we've run out, run out of time. Um, let our listeners know where they can find you if they're interested in finding uh, your content or working with you. Okay, cool. So I've got my own podcast show. Yeah, yeah. Which is the Mind Shift Movement podcast. So that's on all of the podcast platforms. There's around, I think the 21st episode went live this morning. Very cool, very cool. Can you imagine the 16-year-old kid living in that garage, smoking pot or whatever the fuck you were doing? Yeah. Having a podcast. <laughs> no way. No. <laughs> Honestly, it's uh, it's bonkers. And I, I have old school friends message me and say that. They can't believe the changes. It's so, really cool. so incredible. Okay, so you got the podcast. Where else can people find you? Podcast. So I do have um, a an event called Creating Change. Cool. And this is based in Southend. It's a free workshop. Nice. So it's all focused around fitness and mindset. Um, so I run that normally every six weeks. Um, Facebook, I am AJ Fitness and Mindset Coaching, which is uh, my Facebook page, business page. On Instagram, it's Alan underscore Johnson underscore coaching. Nice. Um, and yeah. That is really it, yeah. Places. That's lots of places. Well, we'll add all of that into the show notes so we get the spelling right and people can find you. Um, thank you so much for your time and good luck with everything. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>